Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo Nishwara, Guru Reva Param Brahma, Asmai Shri Gurave, Chinmayam Yabhyat Sarvam, Trilokyam Sacharacharam, Arpadam Darshitam Yena Asmai Shri Gurave Namaha Pameva Mata Chapita Pameva Pameva Bandhus Chasatha Pameva Pameva Vinya Dravitam Pameva Pameva Sarvam Pameva Deva Pameva Sarvam Pameva Deva Om Sahana Bhavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahadiryam Karavavahai Tejas Vinavadhi Kamasumavit Vishavahai Om Shanti 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 So last week we had our introductory comments and we made our way through the first two verses. Isn't that right? We only did two of them? Two or three, yeah, something like that. Let's see. So we're now, uh, we talked about uh, the first one, who shall I salute and bow down to because it's all the self, it's all me. Second, we went through, for whom is this book intended? For those who have achieved a mature sense of renunciation. And again, it's very important to identify for whom this book is intended. In Gita, Krishna says, if you need to have an ego, by all means, be a yogi. That's my idea. So we can also call that the mumukshu, the person who has a burning desire for liberation. And the classic metaphor is you have to think of it, you're in the smashan, the, the, the cremation ground. And the corpse that we're cremating is the ego. And you have a stick, you're using a stick to continue to stir the funeral pyre so that the whole body of the ego gets burnt. And the stick is being the mamukshu, the one who's questing for liberation. At the end, we throw that on too. So, the trap is if we give up our desire for liberation too soon, we get caught into what I call the Vedanta logic loop. And the Vedanta logic loop is if you are coming from the highest place, all this world is illusion. The scriptures are an illusion. The guru is an illusion. The shisha, the student, is an illusion. Bondage is an illusion. 
liberation is the illusion. So I'm screaming and yelling at my boyfriend. That's an illusion, don't worry about it. I can't stand how I feel, so three scotches which should help. Don't worry about it, it's just an illusion. I can't stand the people at the market, so I'm gonna scream at them. Don't worry about it, it's an illusion. Do you see what happens? You end up rationalizing your suffering. That's not freedom. That's not freedom at all. So only you can decide how and when to use the value of the scripture. Any thoughts on this before we go on? All right, what verse are we on? We're on verse four. Verse four. Yadi deham prithakritya jiti vishamya tishtasi adhuneva sukhi shantaha bandhamukto bhavishyasi. If you detach yourself from the body and abide in consciousness, you will at once become happy, peaceful, and free from bondage. Yes. So the bija vasana, the seed attachment, is body identification. From it stem all the problems of ego. So if I'm fighting with my spouse, it's my body that's engaged with the interaction. If I'm having difficulty with family, it's my body that's having all that difficulty. If I'm having difficulty at work, it's my body that's having the difficulty. So it's from body identification that all the rest of our problems extend. So our job is, I am not the body. I'm the knower of the body. We can clearly let go of that identification. Oh, Jim, I want to have a partner. What is it that wants to be partner? The body. Any thoughts on this? Next verse. Natvam vipradiko varno nashami naksha gocharaha asango asimira karo vishwasakshi sukhi pava. You do not belong to the Brahmana or any such caste. Nor do you belong to any station in life, Ashama. You're not perceivable by the senses, unattached, formless, and witness of all you are. Be happy. So here he fleshes out. That's an interesting term I use. <laughs> <laughs> ways in which body identification manifests itself. So here it's Varna and Ashrama. So Varna, caste, you're not a Brahmin, you're not a Kshatriya, etc. So I'm not my family, I'm not Indian, I'm not Chinese, I'm not Mexican. Those are our modern ways of looking at that. I'm not this particular class in life. None of that is true about the self. Yeah, how does that manifest itself? Do I have opinions? 
thoughts about the status of my body in the world. I'm attracted, I'm not attracted. I'm a wealthy person, I'm not a wealthy person. I live in a big house. I will be rich. All that kind of stuff. Not saying these things are nice to have. But is that your identity? Or do you crave that in order to be okay? Then ashrama here means station in life. We have the four classic ones, brahmacharya, your student days. Some people are attached to that. They can be 50 years old. And still think I'm just a kid. You know, I'm not responsible. I want someone to take care of me. I want a daddy. You can be identified as that, not just with your kids. Rahasta, householder, and all that comes with that. I'm identified, I have a family, who I am as a parent to my kids, or the other part of it, one of the other dharmas of Agasta is kama, desire, artha, wealth. I want to be rich, I want to get lots of cash and prizes, toys, boys, all that kind of stuff. Is that who I am? Anaprasta, you all are a little young for this one. That's semi-retirement. Honey, calling a child. I can't fix the faucet. Will you come over and fix the faucet? I can't get my computer to work. Will you come fix my computer? Maybe you have that kind of a relationship with a parent. Yep. <laughs> or the other thing that parents will do. My daughter is a physician. My son works for Smoogle. That's even better than Google. <laughs> And then, of course, it's, why aren't you a lawyer or a doctor? Not, you want to be a dancer? What will the neighbors think? And then you get that kind of pressure as kids. So all this identity that has to do with parents as they get older, where they see children as extensions of their ego. Trauma is sannyas. So when you get old, then you're, if you wish, you can retreat from the world and do spiritual practice on your own. But the deeper meaning is those of us who become identified with our spiritual path. I was talking with a friend in. Uh, who's in recovery and he's looking for a new AA sponsor. And he said, one of the things he looks for is not just whether they have a good message in a meeting, but do they walk the walk when they're outside of the meeting? So they may say brilliant things in the meeting, but when they're at fellowship afterward, are they getting angry? Are they being, you know, snarky and critical and things like that? Same thing with us yogis. Do you put on a veneer of being spiritual when you're here in class? And you leave the Vedanta on the couch. Go home and scream and yell at people. Get all upset and 
filled with craving and desire and control and stuff like that. You want to look spiritual to your friends. Go to parties and talk about the book you're reading or the class you went to. Because your identity is a spiritual person. Truth is, we are none of these things. In the space of consciousness, empty. Any thoughts on this? So the, the slogan I suggest, if I feel like a person, I'm deluded. It's not about being a bad person trying to be good, a sick person trying to get well, an immoral person trying to get virtuous. I want you to just say, shut up and get out. Drop your mind. Not just in class or in your meditation seat, but work on it as we're moving through the world. Now, Ego will say, if I'm in an uncomfortable situation in my life, the thing to do is to run or hide from it. Yoga says, lean into it. Look at it with compassion and curiosity. Oh, look at this. Why you for my husband hurt my feelings? Look at that. Yeah. Here's my old friend. Hypersensitivity, need to control, whatever it is. You become familiar with your kleshas, your afflictions, your doshas, your defects. Any thoughts on this? It's really easy to get impatient with the dosha. It's like that showing up again and again and again and again. Well, you take on the meditation. What if these are going to show up forever for the rest of eternity? What are you going to do about it? Seriously, here's my old friend. Think of it as if you looked in the mirror and there was a body part that you weren't pleased with. Maybe your hips are too big, or you don't like the size of your breasts, or for guys, your shoulders aren't broad enough, or something. It ain't going to change. What do you do? Well, you just don't get upset about it. Isn't that what you do? This thing. I had one come up last night. Old, old friend. Place where my mind is still competitive. That's interesting. But you don't have to do anything with it. Just notice it. Detach. Turn the volume level down. Is that helpful? It may go away.
but that doesn't mean we need to, to, I don't usually like this term, act out on it. You watch it, you see it, but you don't feed it by running with it and acting. That's the difference. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So let's say your husband says or does something and you react. I haven't said this in a while, but there are three relationships that we can develop in life which are conducive to spiritual growth. The relationship with the guru, the relationship with a monastic community, and a committed love relationship, a marriage. The power in all three of them, listen carefully, is the vow. The vow is I'm not going away. What's powerful about it? If you vow I'm not going away, then when, not if, when your ego stuff arises, you're committed to staying there and working on your stuff. Now, I was listening to someone last night who broke up with a partner he's been with six years. No thing. It's opportunity always to work on ourselves. Well, it just didn't work out. Well, it means that we weren't able, I wasn't able to work for enough stuff. And you think going to a monastery is going to be easier? That's just marrying 20 people you've never met before. <laughs> All right, next verse. I have a question. Please. Um, these glaciers, are they hindrances to becoming self-realized? Like, do, am I, can I be self-realized before I get rid of these, or like, work through these I wouldn't glaciers? worry about that. The, the main thing we're going to work on in this text is, who is it who's worried about getting realized? That's another form of ego. You see that? Yeah. So this is the example I like to. So here's the self, here's the little ego. It says, I want to be realized. I want to be realized. Oh, I'm getting closer. Oh, take that glacier. Get rid of it. Oh, I'm almost there. I'm almost there. I'm there now. But that's not what happens. It's Rub, scrape, rub, scrape. Nope. What's left? Is the self. No person getting there. You see the difference? Our attachment to the phenomena of the glacier. It's just material. Now listen very carefully. As you go live on top of a mountain all by yourself, when you empty out and have thinned out your own personal stuff, then you will feel the thoughts and feelings of others as if they were your own. No escape. It's mine. It's always there. Get involved. The 
emptier you are, the more you're aware of the suffering of others. You know that. When your husband's upset, don't you feel it? Yes? Yes. Very intense, isn't it? I'm sure somebody on the bus doesn't feel that way. Really. And I suspect it's hard to tell, is it his upset or is it yours? Am I right? Yes. That's just mine. Doesn't belong to anybody in there. But we deal with it with the same. Get out. Watch it. Don't engage with it. Don't put the hook of eyes in the main stuff. All right, any more on this verse? Next one. Karma karmo sukham dukham manasani na te vipo na karta asina bhokta asi bhuktu evasi sarvada. Virtue and vice, happiness and sorrow are all attributes of the mind, not of yourself, O oh, all-pervading one. You are neither the doer nor the enjoyer. Indeed, you are ever free. So virtue and vice, is he said karma and dharma is what I thought he said, wasn't it? No, karma and adharma. Oh, virtue and vice, yeah. right action, wrong action. All those belong to the personality, to the body. And basically, they're just the opinions of other people. Or that voice in our head, how am I doing? Am I okay? So, I am neither virtuous nor not virtuous I am neither I am the space of consciousness if you inadvertently or because you reacted, hurt someone, apologize and move on. We're all going to make mistakes in this world. And frequently we do things that hurt people, which is very different than doing things to hurt people. Clean it up, make your amends. So virtue and vice, what was the what else was in the verse? Yeah. Happiness and sorrow. Yes. What is happiness? What is sorrow? Happiness is the mind's response to conducive environments. Green lights. What sorrow? Non-conducive environments. Red lights. Everybody gets their allotted dose according to their karma. Our job is to Concern.
Walter owns property. If you get upset every time there's a broken pipe or a leak or a broken window, how long have you been a property owner? 13 years. Does it upset you now? Not now. I learned very quickly things break and they cost what they cost to fix them. <laughs> and let it go. Yeah. Now, that's a good maxim slogan for all of life. Right. Things break and they cost <laughs> what they cost. <laughs> yeah. Very, very good. And And if you've been in a relationship, no one's ever perfect. People are who they are, and our minds keep changing. You make a decision. This is the person I will really keep it all out with. But for who I've chosen, it doesn't mean that you're not going to get upset. All relationships, all marriages are hard work. Any thoughts? Next one. Eko dishtasi sarvasya mukta prayo asi sarvada ayameva kite bantu dishtaram pasya sitaram. You are the one seer of all and are surely ever free. Indeed, this alone is your bondage that you see yourself not as the seer, but as something different. So the seer here, the witness, the knower of everything. I'm the knower of the phenomenal world. I'm the knower of the body and all its senses, sensations. I'm the knower of the feelings. I'm the knower of the thoughts. I'm even the knower of the rising and the falling of egoism. I was talking with a person earlier, and they, they came in and they said, oh, I've been triggered. I've been identified. We didn't get a chance to finish the conversation, but a good question is, how do you know that you're triggered and identified? So I know when the mind is triggered and identified, and I know when it's not. Is that your experience? It's not you. It's not you. It's just phenomenal. So here the verse says, I am the seer, the knower, the noumenon. I am never the phenomenon. What is my bondage? There is no other bondage. And I forget. I am that ultimate illuminator. Nothing touches me. Phenomena just keep going by. Think back five years ago. What upset you five years ago? 
hers and mine. Now, the mind can hang on to stuff. Many a time I will meet people and they, they have been traumatized or they've had a PTSD or something like that. Some event in childhood, they've been sexually abused or they had an abusive parent or something like that. And they're 35, 40 years old and they're still in that story. Of course, if you think logically, is anybody beating you up now? Is anybody assaulting you now? No. It's just a memory. You know, again, it can be very deep lodges in the body. Bring the mind into the present. Nothing can harm the sun. not so much about fixing the mind as getting out of the mind. And the paradox is the way to heal the mind is to get out of it. Go back to your question about clashes. How much therapy do I need to do to get this issue on under control or something like that. Yogi would say, just get out of your mind. Don't feed it. Any thoughts on this? Now, you gotta be very careful. This doesn't mean being in denial. I'm angry or frightened and hurt, and I'm pretending to myself that I'm not. I don't. I just come out sideways. So we want to quit needing to save face to ourselves. The first real commitment that we've abandoned attachment to ego is the willingness to show up as a bastard case. Not be identified. It's just the human mind. It's just the human mind. Any thoughts on this? Going on. Aham Gadevya Ham Manam Krishna Him Hidash Krishna Hi Danshitaha Naham Gade Vishasa Mritam Pitva Sikhipava Sukhipava you who have been bitten by the great black serpent of egoism, I am the doer. Please drink the nectar of faith. I am not the doer and be happy. Yes. So doer and enjoyer, karta and bhokta. Ego thinks I do or I don't do. I'm the bhokta here, though it means literally enjoyer. We can 
better translated as experiencer because you enjoy unhappy things too. I experience it. And here the scripture is saying this idea that there's a me there that's doing and experiencing is illusory. So the meditation we want to take on, either I do nothing, it is the Lord who does it. Same intelligence that's spinning galaxies is making this body, mind, intellect move for you. I stand back just as the witness of it all. Gita will say that the agent is Buddha and Karma, qualities of mind and the force of the past. Oh, Jim, I have two job offers. Should I take this one or should I take that one? I just don't know what to do. But yet he says, you're going to do what you're going to do. It's all been written. But I've got to make a decision before Wednesday. Well, before Wednesday, you'll make a decision. And it's all going to work out. Oh, I was such a fool. How could I have bought such and such or gotten involved with so and so? Oh, it was such a mistake. No. Good in karma. It was what it was. The yogi has no regret. Doesn't mean she doesn't learn from the past. No mistakes. So one thought is I do nothing. It is the Lord that does it. It's Buna and Karma that does it. Or you can take on the meditation, I do everything. It is by virtue of me that roses bloom, the sun shines, the cars go up and down grand. The same intelligence is what's making my eyes blink. I do nothing, I do everything. But what's not true is I do this specific action in this specific body. Someone once gave me the image. I really like it. If you've ever had a female dog who's had puppies, who here's had the dog who's had puppies? You know, a, they have a litter. They don't have just one or two. They have a whole bunch. And then the mother dog is lying down and the uh, little baby dogs, their eyes aren't even open when they're, they're, they're teeny tiny. And it's interesting to watch them kind of move toward the mother's teats, the mother's nipples. So one puppy will latch on and then another puppy will get close and kind of move it out of the way and it latches on. And then third puppy, you know, they, they, they compete for nursing access. That's like our bosses. Why? <laughs> what do they want? Happiness. <laughs> Which one's going to win out of the butt bowl? But it 
it's mindless and it's mechanical. Some of them are runs to the litter. Like, when was the last time you played the piano? <laughs> a while. A while ago. Yeah, that's the run of the litter. <laughs> it's there, but you know, can't get to the teeth very easily. <laughs> when was the last time you worked out at the gym? In a while. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You want to do it, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. It's been a while. We can all we all find those sorts of things. But that's that's all it is. It's just one of those puppies. <laughs> it's all it is. So don't take it so seriously. But if we're bitten by the black snake of egoism, I do. And if I am the doer, I can screw up. And I can make a mistake. And my success and happiness is dependent on my capacity to be in. It's all an illusion. And what will happen? You might have one particular proclivity. It may bring you some joy or it may bring you some sorrow. And for many of us, the time comes when you just know, I'm done with this. This is what we call hitting bottom. This is a term you find in the recovery community. No one gets clean and sober until they hit bottom, meaning they've suffered enough where the suffering is greater than your compulsion to drink and use. And you're done. But that's with every part of Interaction with family. When you finally get tired of the pain, you stop. Doesn't mean you stop interacting. But you stop getting upset about it. Or anything else. Any thoughts on this? Jim, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, can the illusion of having the ego be helpful though it's just in parts of the path so for example when you say there's no zero experience to, i do understand that however there's also the thing of you know if i'm no matter the situation if i'm agitated i'm the one with attachment or identification which means taking responsibility for your life right so in that sense having the illusion of ego can be very helpful in some ways right it all depends on where we are in our son So if I'm identified mm -hmm. and I don't have the capacity to drop that, mm -hmm. then there's yoga for that particular mind state. Yeah. Well, you're right. So if you're identified and you're upset, an even lower form of ego is to try to crush your enemies. I always think of when uh, Donald Trump was first elected and he had his first cabinet meeting. All these cabinet secretaries are sitting around the table. And Trump said, 
your job on a daily basis is to help me vanquish my enemies. Hmm. What did Christ say? He's a vengeful man. He thinks that what it's about is destroying the people who have made him unhappy, threatens evil. So that's a pretty gross form of ego. Does that make sense? Yeah. So a higher form is take responsibility for it. Understand that if I'm disturbed, I'm the one with the problem. Work on that klesha, that affliction, that dosha, that character defect. And when the mind is even more subtle, seek for God. So I'm thinking of a circumstance several months ago where I inadvertently hurt someone's feelings. I was sad that I did that. The next day, sent him a text. Someone told me that what I had said offended you. I'm really sorry. I apologize. That was not my intention. I wouldn't think of that. Does it mean that? I don't do things at the human level that hurt or offend people. Is that making sense? Yes, it is. Ask me if I got particularly upset about it. Stung a little bit because I don't like to hurt people. Apologize and let it go. Years and years and years ago, I made a hate about the person. I would be against me. Defensive. Flashing back. So, the practice to sum it up stay identified as sakshi practice is called sakshi bhava the attitude or the feeling that i am a witness not the body not the mind with all its reactions just watch them don't engage with them. Just don't do something, stand there. And if you're triggered, let the subtle body shake, rattle, and roll, and you stay as the witness of it. Do your best to not be a jerk. Very good yoga. All right, next one. Eko Vishuddha Bodho. Bodho Hamiti Nishaya Vihan Vihan Vihinana Vajralya Kyana Gahanam Vita Shoka Sukhi Pava Having thus burnt down the forest of ignorance with the fire of certitude, I am the one pure consciousness, and discarding all grief, be happy. So we burn down the forest of ignorance. Each one of those trees, Priksha tree, or is that forest? Priksha is tree. Yeah. Each one of those trees in the forest of ignorance is uh, one of our attachments, burn them down. Yeah. 
cosmology used to use the image of a balloon filled with hydrogen or helium. All this force, this millions of little threads. Each attachment, snip, snip, snip. The last attachment has been snipped. You never know what it is. Ooh, rise, expand, not a person anymore. Now, sometimes I know who I am. Other times I get I get. So what Shankara says is, even after realization of the truth, there exists a strong impression that one is the doer and the enjoyer, which is the cause for rebirth. What this means is not that I'm going to have another incarnation. It means I get re-identified. And he says, this needs to be conscientiously rooted out. How? Steady and continuous identification with the self, not just in my meditation seat, but as I'm moving through life. Now, you hear stories of the, the last line of that verse is, the annihilation of the Vasanas here and now is considered liberation by the wise all the attachments. So, many people think the guru is like a physical person. And you hear stories of the guru poking at our egos. He may, but guru is really a principle. It's operating for everybody, but for us yogis, we're conscious about it. So our karma will bring to us the perfect event where Guru will say, okay, this is where your klesha is. Here's your opportunity to let go and let go. Oh, you missed it. Don't worry. Here it is again. It's an opportunity. How could you have said or done that to me? You're the problem. Oh, it's okay. One more time. Guru. until we let go. So back to what Walter was saying earlier. Now, do things break? Do they still cost money? Yes. At your properties? Yes. So it didn't stop, did it? No. Are you upset about it now? No. It's fine for it. The world didn't change, but something in you let go. Do you all catch that? That's what happens. Family's going to be family. Spouses are going to be spouses. And what what do you do though in the case of say you have a person? I don't like this term, but people will talk about having a toxic person in their life, right? Someone who is actively hurtful, or how do you, is, I mean, I think you need to get, sometimes you Last just cut those people, cut those, but can you, if you're cutting those people out, and you're like, I'm not going to engage with them anymore. Sometimes that, we can do that, sometimes we can't. What I would do is, first of all, you check your heart. Can you come to a place of neutrality with them? 
Now, if it's in the work environment, or let's say in your apartment building, someone in another apartment, or a business person you have to interact with, you can't really get away. But you don't have to react. Um, how do I know when I'm finished with some thing? Maybe there is a toxic, let's say, a friend, and you just decide this is a really negative person. You can try putting some space in the relationship. Don't be frightened. And if you're not done with it, you'll find another toxic person showing up. <laughs> but one of the things we do as yogis is we learn how to be truthful, direct, but kind. And I think I've told you about the interaction I had with my boss's father at St. Augustine. I tell this story frequently. So I have my boss, the priest, the rector, the boss. And at Christmas and Easter, he would invite his parents to come. And his father used to make horrible cutting. And one of my colleagues had worn, uh, she was dressed nicely. She had a, a beige colored shell on and then a lace blouse over it. And this fellow said, oh, you're coming to church in your underwear, huh? It was really an awful thing to say to someone. And she just really went into the other room. So I turned. I said, you know, I don't find cruelty funny. So I'm going to leave the room. Dead silence. God bless him. I never heard him do it again. He got it. So sometimes, if it's a toxic person, if you kindly but directly say something, you might preserve the relationship. I don't know if that's useful. Yeah, thank you. And if you're going to end the relationship, what, anyway, what have you got to lose, right? But these can be consciousness-raising moments. Nobody has the power to make us feel anything. Nobody does. We choose. And I have a dear friend, my friend Susan. She just laughs at people. She, aren't you powerful? <laughs> she says it all the time. I don't know if that's useful. Yes, thank you. All right, one more and then we'll quit. Yatra Vishamidam Kati Kalpitam Rajya Sarpat Sarpavar Ananda Paramananda Sapodasvam Sukhamchara. You are that consciousness, bliss 
supreme bliss upon which this universe appears superimposed like a snake on a rope. Live happily as that blissful consciousness. So this is a tricky one. We oftentimes hear the term Satchidananda to refer to the self, pure existence, pure awareness, this absolute. We're always that self. Well, Jim, I'm not blissful all the time. How can the self be bliss if it's always there and I'm always the self? The self is Ananda. I don't feel blissful. What's going on? So we have to understand that what the scripture means by Ananda may be different than our romantic notion. Is that clear? So I suggest we start by translating Ananda as no sorrow reaches there. Physical pain gets to my body, emotional torment gets to my mind, doubt and confusion gets to my intellect, but none of it touches me. Well, why do we call it such a chunya? <laughs> Why do we say such an ananda? Because of the dharma of the human mind. The dharma of the human mind, it is a pleasure seeker pain avoider mechanism. That's what it's doing. From the moment you get up in the morning to the moment your head hits the pillow at night, you're really only engaged in one activity. How to find the good, as you understand it, and avoid misery. Its nature. The mind's one great question is well, where is happiness? In my ignorance, I think it's in people, places, things, and conditions. What the yogi rediscovers is oh, when the mind abides in the self. The mind is this full. So maybe we can translate Ananda as the fountainhead of all joy. Because when the mind revels in the self, we have Brahmananda Rasa. The juice, the taste of breath. Shankara talks about this when he has the qualifications of a good teacher. He says, who's a full knower of the Supreme, who has retired. How do I have a blissful mind, a happy mind, a joyful mind, a peaceful mind? Let go of the I call it the cosmic teeter totter. No bliss, lots of attachment. Let go of the world. Let go of my attachments. Let go of my identifications. Touch the mind. This video. This. Am I How deeply can the mind revel in Brahman? There's no end. Price tag is to let go of fear. Yeah. 
Yeah, the world's not problematic. It's just all, it's empty. There's not anything really called worldly happiness. The only happiness I've ever experienced is my self nature. I think I want a part. Okay, nothing wrong with that. How are you going to feel if you get the part? That's yourself. I want the toxic person to behave. How are you going to feel when they behave? That's yourself. Whatever it is. Use the word to induce the same. Okay, we'll end here today. Jim, could I ask a question? For you? Certainly. My question is how does the mind revel directly in the self? Because is it that you drop all the thoughts? But when you see the mind rebels, it was just that the mind is active in that sense. Of Doesn't mean the lack of thought. Okay. It means the lack of belief in the reality of the mind. It means that I've given up my fascination with my concern with the world and all the stupidity. So it's in some ways equanimity of mind. And you may have some of that now, but I promise you, the more you let go of the world, the deeper it will become. And that's a body in itself. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying that. But every time you eat an ice cream cone, you're a body in itself. You just made that point. Do you enjoy ice cream? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we prove it every night in deep sleep. Everybody loves deep sleep. What object has caused the pleasure of deep sleep? Okay. It's pleasurable because the mind has quit its shape of shock. All right, we'll end here. Oh, poor Namada, poor Namidam, poor Nat, poor Namudachite. Purnasya Purnama Daya Purnameva Vashishate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Sri Guru Yonamaha Hari Om Thank you all. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim.